Sam. Yes, sir. What do you think? If, uh, if Joshua can show us that Jesus is not who Christians believe he is, we'd have to reject him, right? If we're going to be honest to God, because we're going to answer to God, yes, we have no choice but to reject him. All right. Well, we want to continue with our clips. This is from a program, The Dean Show, where Joshua gives his top ten reasons, his best reasons, the best reasons he could find to show that Jesus is not God. Joshua Evans, again, is a former youth pastor, and he's being touted by Muslims as um, a former devout Christian, and so someone you should listen to, because it's, it's one thing if someone who's a Muslim or a Christian but doesn't know a lot about their religion converts, right? You say, well, that person didn't know a lot. But Muslims are saying, ah, here's a, a former youth pastor. Obviously, this guy knew his stuff. So when he leaves Christianity and when he accepts Islam, it will be for very good reason. So that's the idea behind this. And what we're doing is we're looking at these reasons and we're seeing uh, how they stand up to any sort of uh, critical examination. So we're going to go ahead and look at our first clip of the evening. Here's Joshua's next argument on why we should reject the deity of Christ. Let's play the clip. Number seven, talk to me, brother. Number seven is this concept was not taught by Jesus or his disciples, nor was it believed in by his followers and uh, the early followers of Christianity. As we see when, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, we see that the early Christians were still a part of Judaism. For instance, when, if you read the book of Acts, when Jesus Christ had, had, had departed from this earth, the, the disciples still uh, daily attended the synagogue. Um, that was revelation to me. We're, you know, we're, I, I learned something new today, Dave, honestly. I learned something new today. Sam and I aren't the nicest guys in the world, but we're trying to be nice. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, 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 we're really, really trying oh, yeah. to be nice here. Um, I, I, Sam, you've said things that are totally absurd in the past at, at various yes. points in your life, right? Yes. I have too. Yes. I have said things that are just silly based on... Yeah points of ignorance in the past. And you've said things about Christianity and Islam in some context that, yes, that you later found out were wrong. And you, yeah, didn't know, no, you didn't know what you were talking yeah, unfortunately, about. Unfortunately, it's to my shame, yes. And especially, you know, if you're, if you're in a debate, you know, you're firing off, you, you, you try, but, but sometimes your, your mouth is going faster than your brain can process information, right? That I'm happens guilty to of people, that. Yeah, right? I've done that, yeah. I'm that happens to people. And so if you're on a TV show, if you're on a TV show, maybe you say something that's, that isn't entirely accurate. And so when, when Joshua is, is pointing to the uh, people of the community of, of Qumran, these are the Essenes, right. as followers of Jesus, and we're not playing the, we're not, we're not playing the entire clip. You can, you, can watch, you can watch the rest of what he says. According to Joshua Evans, the Essenes, the people who, who composed the Dead Sea Scrolls, were followers of Jesus who looked to Jesus as their prophet. As the prophet. That's yeah, they're, right. they're, 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 they're a community of Muslims. Follow, following Jesus as Precisely. a prophet. That's what he said. They produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is why I'm saying this was revelation to me. This, this is, this uh, is, uh, was, yeah, man, this is uh, boy, this is some, some groundbreaking stuff. Maybe yes. Joshua uh, has some reason for this, and, and, but we, we have to say it doesn't sound like he knows a lot what he's talking yeah, about unfortunately. right here. But we are willing to let that slide, right? It's not, it's yeah, not a terribly important point. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's it's not a, it's Maybe not he a, writes some books where uh, the Essenes supposedly influenced the Jewish followers of Jesus and misunderstood and misinterpreted to mean Oh, see, they were all followers of Jesus. Yeah. Because there, there, there is a connection, some would say, between John the Baptist and the, the Essenes, in that uh, they, they have a lot of similarities, but even though there, there, there are a lot of differences as well, in that John was you know, going around baptizing all of uh, Israel, whereas the Essenes were like a separatist group. We're going to go off and live isolated from, from everyone else. And do you have some weird, weird uh, views that say that the teacher of righteousness mentioned the scrolls is actually James, the lesser, the brother of Christ. So that's probably where he got it from mm -hmm. because there are those people out there that say that the teacher of right, righteousness mm -hmm. is James, the lesser, which was the name of the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was in opposition to the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. So that's probably where he picked it up but didn't understand what the scholar was saying. And even that view is not accepted by mainstream scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to appeal to scholarship because scholarship is not always right. But in this case, mainstream scholarship is correct. Yeah. The teacher of righteousness is not James the Lesser. And regardless, these certainly weren't followers of, of Jesus as a prophet, right? The, the community uh, predates Jesus' yes. uh, work and ministry. Yep. Um, but, so we're going to let that slide. But Joshua says that Jesus' followers didn't teach his deity, despite the yeah. fact that we read 
that we read, the opening verses of John and, and several other passages from the book of John. John was a follower of Jesus, right? Precisely. And you have, and again, well, in, 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 the, in the next coming shows and maybe later in this show, we'll be reading other passages of the New Testament from Jesus' followers, arguing that Jesus is divine, that he is God. But he specifically appealed to the book of Acts. So I'm, I'm wondering what we have there in the book of Acts, Sam, because he is going to the book of Acts to argue that these followers of Jesus, they just kept going to the temple, so they're just living as, as normal Jews. And maybe they believe in Jesus as a prophet, yeah. but you know, they obviously don't believe in the deity of Christ because then you know, they would have been kicked out. Yeah, yeah. It, it's ironic he's appealing to the book of Acts, and he trusts Acts enough to tell him, tell him that Jesus' Jewish followers worship at the temple, but he conveniently fails to mention that even in those references to the apostles of Jesus Christ going to the temple, in those references, we find the very apostles themselves proclaiming the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, and his physical bodily resurrection from the day on the third day, and ascension to the right hand of God to sit in throne as Lord over creation. That's all the same book of Acts in the same chapters that he's alluding to. So now if you're going to say that this is actually the proclamation of the first followers of Christ, then right now, Yusha Evans has dug a hole for himself. Because the same sources he appealed to as saying that, yeah, see, this is what they preached. This is the actual proclamation of the first followers of Christ. That same source goes on to tell us they did affirm the deity of Christ, his death, bodily, physical bodily resurrection, and ascension to heaven as Lord of all creation. In fact, let me just read one passage, and again, begging the Lord Jesus for a powerful anointing on you and me. So in the power of the Holy Spirit, we represent these arguments correctly and interpret Scripture for the glory of Jesus, with the hopes that Christians get blessed and Muslims get convicted to repent in Jesus' name. I invoke the grace of the Lord upon us. Acts 3, 13 and 16. All I need to do is just read this. <clears throat> I don't need to read anything else, but Acts 3, 13 and 16. This is Peter, by the, mind you. Peter proclaiming as he went to the temple to worship. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. See, Yusha Evans could say, aha, see, servant. Allah has glorified Isa, his servant, Abdullah, Islam right there. Hold on, let's finish to see what he means. The one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one. Titles signifying the absolute purity and sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, holy one happens to be another one of the names of Allah. And righteous one, holy one, Qudus, and righteous one is Sadiq both of which are names of Allah. Peter is ascribing to Jesus some of the very names, characteristics of Allah. That's one. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murder to be granted to you, but put to death the author of life. Put to death the author of life. How do you put to death the author of life? Unless the author Who? of life becomes flesh. Who's the author of life? The one they put to death, Jesus Christ our Lord. Whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are his witnesses. So Peter's saying, I am a witness to the resurrection, and I am telling you, he is the author of life, whom you put to death, but God raised up, and I saw him alive. This is actually the very source that Yusha Evans is appealing to, to try to disprove the deed of Christ. I mean, again, I like Yusha Evans to answer this. Maybe he'll watch these programs. In fact, we invite him to come on live and have a dialogue with us. And I'm sure you agree with me. Are you open to dialogue, di dialoguing with Yusha Evans over these issues? Uh, yeah, and actually, I'll, 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 make, it e I'll make it even uh, more interesting because he, he obviously isn't familiar with a lot of the passages that we're bringing up. He can bring friends, can he not? Anyone he wants. We will in he can bring friends. If he wants to get Shabir Ali and Zakir Naik Definitely. and Jamal Badawi, bring, bring an him. army, right? Please, yes. Bring an army. We, will, we would love to have. We would love to have a discussion on these passages yes. and this issue. And we're certainly, certainly not afraid. And let me just finish the verse and then tell me what you think of this, David. Uh, verse 16, and on the basis of faith in his name. Notice, faith in Jesus' name. It is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. Now the context, and you have to read the context. There was a paralytic whom Peter healed in the name of Jesus, not in the name of Allah or in the name of the Father. In the name of Jesus, this man was miraculously healed in front of witnesses, and that's what he's saying. It is the name of Jesus that has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. So no, notice this. 
Jesus Christ is the Holy and Righteous One. Titles that even the Quran acknowledges belong to Allah. Jesus is the author of life. An another title signifying that Christ is the source of life. After all, to be the author of life means you're the source of life. And again, that's something you can only say of God. Christ was put to death, raised to life, and Peter was a witness to the resurrection. And in Jesus' name, miracles are being performed. Does this sound like the first Christians did not believe the deity of Christ? And does this sound like the first followers of Christ were Muslims? Uh, not at all. <laughs> this and is the, <laughs> this so is the, we, we, we could go on, and uh, maybe, we, maybe we'll have uh, in the future some shows, Deity of Christ in the Book of Acts, where we can go passage by passage. Uh, we might want to do that one day, Deity of Christ in the Book of Mark, Deity of Christ in the Book of Matthew, and, and so sure. on, just to go systematically through, uh, through the entire books to get all of the details. But, but here's the point. Joshua Evans goes to the Book of Acts to get some information out of there, and he says, Aha, you see here, Jesus was just a prophet. And then just, I mean, come on, read the book. Read the book. Jesus is not just a prophet according to the Book of Acts, and his original followers did not believe that he was just a prophet. And to say, well, I'm reading the Bible, I'm, I'm looking through the Bible, and he's just a prophet of Islam, um, and his original followers did not believe that he is divine, <coughs> that just completely, completely uh, distorts the meaning of the text. When, when Jesus was through, when Jesus um, died and rose from the dead and then ascended to heaven, um, it didn't take long before you only had two kinds of, well, you, you could say you had three kinds of people. You had people who didn't know anything about Jesus, who didn't know a lot about him. Uh, but uh, the people who did know him, the people who did know what he was saying, who witnessed his claims, there are only two kinds of those people. Those who were bowing down and worshiping him and preaching in his name, and those who called him a blasphemer and wanted him dead. Right? Those are the two kinds of people. Those are the people who ex witness what Jesus said, they either wanted him dead for blasphemy or they were bowing down and worshiping. Because once you hear the sort of claims Jesus was making, those, those are your options. Um, in other words, those people didn't do what Joshua does, namely ignore everything you don't like and ever ignore everything that doesn't line up with Islam. All right, let's go ahead and go on to the next video. Maybe Joshua's going to have something better for us in this next clip. This whole concept of Trinity did not come about until the third century of the church, and it was not formulated as a doctrine that must be believed in until 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea, when um, all of the bishops and the, and, the, and the scholars of Christianity, which started to form into Christianity after Paul, came together and said, okay, this is a doctrine that we must believe in. And the first person to expound this doctrine was Paul, who never saw Jesus Christ himself, never walked with him, never talked to him, never saw him, never ate with him, never learned from him. What's wrong with this passage? Wow. <laughs> Let me let me count the, the waves, yeah. let me count the waves. Um, did you all catch that? Did you did you catch Joshua Evans saying, the doctrine of the Trinity didn't come along until the third century. Yep. Then he says it, it it was it was made official at the Council of Nicaea. That's 325. So that's the yep. fourth century. Then he says it was first put forward by the Apostle, Apostle Paul, Paul who expanded, was yes. in the first century. He was a contemporary of Jesus and the Apostles. Yeah. So the doctrine of the Trinity <clears throat> was invented in the third century, and somehow Paul was preaching it in the first century. Now, unless we're going to start yeah. getting into some time yeah. travel here, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Joshua has some issues in what he's putting forth. Yeah. Um, let's, assume, let's assume that he misspoke, and what we'll say is, in order to make his view coherent, the Apostle Paul first preached the doctrine of the Trinity. But maybe it didn't catch on until much later. Maybe that's what he was saying, right? Yeah. So, so we'll be, we'll the be, we'll be charitable. Yeah. We'll be charitable yeah. and, and conclude that he simply uh, misspoke in what he was saying. And we can see why he would say that the, the Apostle Paul preached the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, Paul's writings are saturated uh, with referring to the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you even, you even find them together uh, in certain places. Yeah. So let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, where Paul says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. That's right. And you have this over and over again in the Bible, Biotic not patterns. just from the Apostle Paul. Over and over again, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's never a fourth, right? Exactly. It's never a fourth. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me read two more passages. Uh, one from the Gospel of Mark and one from the Gospel of Matthew, just to show you that it's not just Paul who is teaching this. 
This is the gospel according to Mark, and he's talking about the baptism of Jesus. And so chapter 1, beginning at verse 9, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit, uh, like a dove, descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. So God speaks from heaven, saying that Jesus is the Son, and the Spirit descends like a dove. Father, no Son, one has Holy ever Spirit. heard the voice of God. What are you talking about? All right. Right. Not according to Joshua's interpretation of the Bible. And let me just expand real quickly on Mark 111. What's the point? Jesus Christ in his messianic role, because he did become flesh. So he's not just God, he's the God-man. And in his role as Messiah, chose to depend completely on the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the Father's will on earth in his messianic role. So the Spirit comes down upon Jesus to empower him to successfully carry out his role as Messiah. And we have God speaking from heaven saying, He is my Son whom I love, and I'm well pleased with him. Clear, clear reference to three distinct persons, and yet the roles they take and the tasks they, they assume demonstrate their deity because only one who is God can do the things that Jesus does, and only one only one who is God can do what the Holy Spirit does, and we know the Father is God. So quite clear, that's Trinitarian passage right there. Right. Let me read uh, one more passage. This is from the Gospel according to Matthew, and this is um, called the Great Commission by Christians. This is after Jesus has died by crucifixion, he has risen from the dead, he appears to his followers, some of whom are actually uh, doubting. If you've heard that your, uh, that, that, that your Messiah had died and rose, risen from the dead, you might have some doubts. Here's what happens. Chapter 28, beginning at verse 16, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. What were they doing? Worshipping Jesus. Precisely. Why right? were they doing that? And this wasn't just here. They were worshipping during his ministry. Right? In fact, according to the Gospels, Jesus was worshipped shortly after his birth, when he's, when he's a, a very young child. He's worshipped numerous times during his earthly ministry. He's worshipped after his resurrection but before his ascension and even after he ascended he was then worshiped so every major stage people are worshiping jesus you know what jesus never bothers to say stop worshiping me never occurs to him to say stop worshiping me uh, maybe he'll say it here though let's read when they saw him they worshiped him but some were doubtful and jesus came up and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Can I read a Quran verse to answer your question? Yes, please. Chapter 3, verse 189. To Allah belongs the sovereignty, the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, and Allah has power over all things. That's chapter 3, verse 189 of the Quran. So according to the Quran, what Jesus said is something that only God can say. And yet he says it anyway, even though he's just claiming to be a prophet who has nothing to do with the divine trinity. Let's okay. keep reading, though. Verse 19, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, hmm. Sam, there, there are kind of two issues here. Yes. One, you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're supposed to baptize in the name, name singular, exactly. name, singular Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And second, Jesus is with his followers always. So is he, he's with us here? Precisely. He's and, with and all believers the world over till the end of the age. And he's with his followers in China? Precisely. And he's with his followers in Europe and Africa? Everywhere, yes. In the wherever, Middle East? Wherever the saints are, Christ is with them. What kind of attribute would Jesus need to have in order to be with his followers everywhere and forever? Not only would he have to be omnipresent, he would have to be ever living. And in that particular context, he's giving them the commission not to be afraid. Go throughout the world. You're going to go into hostile territory, but don't be afraid, basically. This is what Jesus basically is getting at. Don't be afraid of what you're going to face because I'm with you to guarantee the success of your mission. They're going to be successful no matter what people try to do to thwart their purposes. Why? I am with you. So he's claiming to be omnipresent, ever living, and omnipotent, which are attributes that belong only to God, which even the Quran agrees. And ironically, uh, depending on the type of Muslim that Yusha Evans is, and I suspect he's a Salafi. Now, I don't know because I haven't heard him say he's a Salafi. Salafi Muslims don't even believe that Allah is omnipresent because they believe that Allah has a body of some kind. Now, let me 
qualify that. They'll deny that his body is, is like anything in creation. But still they insist that he does have eyes, he has hands, he has a shin, and he's actually above the throne, which is above the seven heavens, and therefore is not omnipresent. He knows all things, but he's not omnipresent. So even, even certain Muslim groups deny the omnipresence of God, and yet Jesus, who's only a prophet, who's supposed to be a Muslim, affirms that he is omnipresent. So here we have Christ claiming to be omnipresent, omnipotent, and ever-living. And the fact with, in the name, singular, he doesn't say names, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, just to show you how strong an assertion to the essential unity of the members of the Godhead that statement is, I challenge any Muslim, especially Yusha Evans, to say, in the name of Allah and Muhammad and Gabriel, in the name of Allah and Muhammad and Gabriel, he will never da dare utter those words because you can never group creatures with God in the unity of his name. And by the way, from a biblical perspective, the term name means more than simply what is your name, like your proper name. The term name, from a biblical perspective, refers to a person's characteristics, his essence, and authority. So by saying, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is affirming that all three are essentially co-equal, having the same authority. Does that sound like a Muslim prophet, or does that sound like the Lord of all believers affirming the triunity of God? And yet, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, was invented by Paul and somehow didn't come along until centuries later. Invented by Paul in the third century. Yes, and what you have now, now we've gone to a couple of the texts where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, are clearly mentioned together. But you, the, the bottom line is you can't make sense of the New Testament, any of these exactly. books, without understanding the doctrine of the Trinity. Because over and over again, you're going to learn that the Father is God, that the Spirit is God, that the Son is God, and that there is only one God. Well, you can either say, well, this is just nonsense, it's, it's just incoherent, or you could recognize what the Bible is teaching. What you have is that God revealed certain things at the time of the, the Old Testament, and even revealed that there is a plurality within his nature. And yet, it's when you get to the New Testament where God gives us a fuller understanding, a deep understanding of his nature. Something that we should stand in awe of. Wow, this is, this is how God is. And yet, Muslims, oh, I don't get it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, let me just blame it on the Council of Nicaea and the Apostle Paul somehow. Oh, poor Council of Nicaea. It gets uh, too much credit, right? Credit yeah. for too and, and, much and, credit. By, by the way, uh, Christians, uh, be, because we, we've, been, we've been looking into, you know, we've been, we've been asking, uh, you know, what kind of, what kind of uh, background Joshua Evans had. When you hear anyone say anything about some Christian doctrine being invented at the Council of Nicaea or about the canon of the New Testament being selected at the Council of Nicaea, you've just run into someone who has absolutely no clue what he's talking about. Exactly. Didn't happen. Precisely. All right, let's go on to the next clip. Let's see what Joshua has in store for us now. Six. Number six reason is a very big one and very plain one. Jesus ate, slept, and prayed. He ate, slept, and prayed. And we know God, by His very nature, is self-sufficient. He does not need anything to continue His existence. God does not need to eat. God does not need to sleep. God does not need to pray. God is not in need of anything, because if He was in need of something, then He would not be God. I find it strange that a former youth pastor has no understanding of the Incarnation. Precisely, right? yeah. Well, the doctrine of the incarnation. How could, how, could, how could God eat? How could God die? How could God pray, right? Doesn't make any sense. Well, no, if you're thinking of, of God in, in, his, uh, in his, just in his divine, eternal, perfect nature, how could that sort of being do any of this? Um, but that's not what we're talking about. And just to go back to an example we used on the last program, this is a Quran. Muslim, let me tell you what Muslims believe about the Quran. Muslims believe that the word of Allah is eternal. It's eternal. It has no beginning. It cannot be corrupted. It, it has no beginning, has no end, cannot be destroyed. And yet this book, this physical Quran, is made of paper and glue and ink. You put this in the wrong person's hands right now, he will rip it up. What's that mean? That the eternal word of Allah can be torn up and destroyed by a human being? No Muslim would say that. No Muslim would say, if you destroyed a Quran, no Muslim would say, oh, I guess the Quran wasn't eternal. 
No Muslim's going to say that. So why, when we say, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and since the Word became flesh, yes. then that Word can now do things that are associated with a fleshly being. If you say that's silly and that's absurd, then guess what? You Muslims who, who use that sort of argument, you just refuted the Quran as well. Precisely. The Quran, according to Islam, has two natures. It has its eternal nature. It has its physical nature. You can do things to the physical nature. There are things that are associated with the, fa with the physical nature, paper, glue, and ink, that you don't say about the eternal nature. Likewise, the doctrine of the incarnation is that the Word, who is God, entered creation, took on a physical nature, and because he has that physical nature, that physical nature is capable of doing certain things that you wouldn't apply to the eternal nature. This is 101. This is theology 101, and a former youth pastor has no clue what we're talking about, and he doesn't even know that Islam teaches something very similar that would be refuted by his argument as well. We need to emphasize that, that not only did he become flesh, but it says in Scripture that he became flesh for the specific purpose of experiencing genuine human limitations and experiencing what it is to be human now can you imagine jesus christ becoming flesh without needing to eat and drink and sleep as a man would he then be experiencing genuine human limitations could we say that he's truly human like us in every way with the exception of sin of course not that means that that body is simply a phantom body that he's not truly human in nature but our belief on the basis of scripture is that christ didn't simply assume human form he actually became a flesh and blood human being to experience and encounter human limitations so that he would personally experience firsthand what it's like to be a human being living in the midst of human beings. He didn't have to do this. He chose to do this out of his infinite love for us. At the same time, and I don't want to take too much time on this, but try to do it real quickly. Same time, because he's also God, the same Jesus who ate and drank and slept is the same Jesus who could say in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, and I'll just read the first verse, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ is saying to everyone who is tired, everyone who's fatigued, everyone who's anguished, come to him, and he has the ability to give everyone who comes to him rest. Again, Dave, help me understand what kind of characteristics must Jesus have? Remember, he's a man. We, we, we agree. Amen. He's a man. He ate. Praise the Lord. He's a true human being with the exception of sin. What kind of characteristics must he have in order to guarantee that all who come to him, they will experience everlasting refreshment and rest? He would have to be all-knowing, omnipresent, and all-powerful. He'd have to have the omni attributes. Oh, but he ate and drank. What do you mean? Oh, so you mean he's man who's also God? He's God who's also man? Sure sounds like what we've been teaching for 2,000 years. we've been teaching years. for 2,000 right? years, and what Joshua Evans doesn't seem to have a clue, we actually believe. Um, so we talked about the ate and slept. Jesus actually took on a human nature, and you Muslims, if you believe that's silly and that's absurd, something that's divine cannot take on a physical nature, then you need to reject Islam because that's what Islam teaches about the doctrine of the Quran. The eternal word entered our world as a physical book which can be destroyed even though that even though by destroying this book you would not destroy the eternal word of Allah but on the issue of prayer and in a moment we're gonna look at a video so we can apply this to Islam but on the issue of prayer Muslims always when they when they when they criticize it here they presuppose Unitarianism yeah. to show that our view is incoherent when our view is Trinitarian and their argument Precisely. would not apply to that let, let, let me explain what I mean he says aha Jesus prayed. That's just silly, because if you prayed, then who would you be talking to? Would you be talking to yourself if you were God? That wouldn't make any sense. Well, not if, if you're a Unitarian, no. And we're going to see what kind of problem this poses for Islam here in a moment. If you're a Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all one in nature and essence. The Father and the Son have loved each other for all eternity. When the Son enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth, as James White often points out, is he going to become an atheist? Yes. Or is he going to continue that, that, that communication with his Father, whom he's been communicating with through exactly, all yeah. eternity? No, he's going, to, he's going to stop talking to the Father, go on his own, and do what he wants. That's what they want us. That's what we would have to find in the Scriptures in order to satisfy or to, to, you know, to even it makes sense out of their argument because this argument that he's raising is nonsensical if we believe 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit are distinct persons in perfect communion and love with one another. If that's the case, let's just assume Trinitarianism is true, then we would expect to find Christ continuing that communion, that fellowship, that dialogue with the Father that he's enjoyed even before becoming flesh. But the way Yusha Evans makes, uh, makes it uh, appear is that such could not be the case if he's God. Well, yeah, he'd be right if we're Unitarians, yeah. and we believe that Jesus is the only person of the Godhead. But remember, he's a former Christian minister. He knows that we're Trinitarians. So either, again, he was ignorant of the Trinity, which is why he became Muslim, because he had no clue what he was supposed to believe, or he knows better, and he's simply trying to pull a fast one to score cheap debate tricks and deceive people by deliberately misrepresenting our faith. For the sake of charity, we'll say he was ignorant of his former faith. And so what we have here is that Jesus prayed, which if you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity mm -hmm. and the Incarnation makes perfect Precisely. sense. And the doctrine of the Trinity is what allows you to make sense of Scripture as a whole, from Amen. Genesis to Revelation. Without the doctrine of the Trinity, it's not going to make sense. You're going to end up saying things like, well, if Jesus is God, who is he praying? You're going to end up saying things like that. Not if you're a Trinitarian. That's why we're Trinitarians. It's the only way to make sense of what God has revealed and to just, us. And ask you another question so we can go to the next clip. Jesus as the perfect man, does the perfect man not worship God? If, if, if God exists, and we both believe he exists, and God defines the perfect man as the one who perfectly submits and worships him, if Jesus became a flesh and blood human being in order to become that perfect man, to be man as God intended man to be, should we be surprised to find him as a man, not just as God in relationship to the Father, but even as a man, worshiping God the Father, which all perfect men are supposed to do? Well, he, he, he would have to become an atheist, according to Joshua Evans. So the perfect, perfect man, man, according to his view, would be an atheist. That's all right. the only way to make sense of what he's saying. Unless okay. the, all right. All right, but now we're going to see how this poses a problem for Islam. Because according to Joshua Evans, it would be absurd for Jesus to pray if Jesus is God. <coughs> well, we've seen how Jesus praying makes perfect sense in light of the doctrine of the Trinity. But what, what can we say about it with respect to Islam? Let's go ahead and get the next clip. And then Jesus prayed. He was in need of prayer. Anytime he had an issue, he would pray. He would tell the disciples, I need to go pray. Wait here while I pray. Wait here while I pray. He would go to the temple, pray, prostrating on his face on the ground. This in his very nature showed that he was in need of something greater than himself because that is the essence of prayer. It's showing that you're in need of someone who is greater than you. The essence of prayer, Sam. Uh, well, what's the Arabic for, uh, for prayer, by the way? Salah. Okay, right, so salah. the essence. The salawat. The essence of prayer, according to Joshua Evans, is showing that you are in need and there is something greater than you. Yeah, in need of someone greater than you. You said it, right? He defined it. He said it. it. He said it. Yeah. He said it. Yeah, now, we didn't have to find it. He did. We've seen how Jesus entering into creation, the doctrine of the incarnation and the doctrine of the Trinity. You can make perfect sense of Jesus praying. What happens when we apply? So his argument against Christianity fails. It just displays ignorance or deception. Precisely. But what happens if we hold Joshua consistent and say, but let's apply what you're saying to Islam? What do we end up with? Well, then you're going to have major problems because the Quran, as well as certain narrations attributed to Muhammad, explicitly affirm that Allah himself prays. In fact, I'm going to read three Quranic passages, give you the Arabic words, right, and then translate them accordingly because unfortunately, and this is what... Uh, needs to be known by the people listening to this. Maybe some of you are watching us for the first time. Some of you have been following us over the years, so you already know these arguments. But for, in case of those of you watching us for the first time, unfortunately, most English translations of the Quran obscure what these Arabic words mean. Therefore, I'm going to give you the Arabic words, translate what the words mean, and I invite you to look at any Arabic, Arabic lexical source an authentic narration attributed to Muhammad to see how these terms are defined. And we have all that in resource, that information on our own websites, which we'll give the links to a little later, Lord willing. But let me go to the verses themselves. Chapter 2, verse 157 of the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 157. They are those on whom, on whom are the prayers, salawatun, from salawat. They are those on whom are the prayers from their Lord, salawat. Here it uses the word salawat. So that Allah, their Lord, the Lord of these people, sends down his prayers, his salawat upon them, and his mercy. So not only his prayers, but his mercy are given to them. 
And it is they who are the guided ones. The word is salawat. Be careful of those who will try to tell you, oh no, it means blessing. There is an Arabic word for blessing, baraka, and it's not used here. The word is salawat. Ask any Arabic speaker what does that mean. And he or she will tell you it means prayer or worship. Two other references. Chapter 33, verse 43. Chapter 33, verse 43. He, Allah, it is, who prays for you. Who prays for you. You salli. From the verb salla. He it is who prays for you. You salli. The first verse used salawat. Here it uses the verb salla. You salli. And his angels too. Now notice. If, if there was any confusion as to the meaning of the term. It says Allah and his angels. Salla. Pray. For who? For you believers. Now if I ask David. Would any Muslim deny that. Here, the Quran is saying that angels are praying for believers. No, of course not. But in the same context, it says that Allah is also performing that same action that angels are performing for believers. So angels are praying for believers, as is Allah. How in the world can someone get around this by denying, no, this verb, this word doesn't mean that Allah is praying, even though it's applied to angels, and no one would deny that angels do pray, especially for believers. The third verse, 3356, 3356. Verily, 3356, Allah and his angels. Here's another verse that says that Allah is performing the same action that angels are performing, even using the Arabic conjunction wa, which Muslim scholars will tell you is the conjunction of partnership. So together they're doing this, right? Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet, right? Ya Saluna, pray for the Prophet. Ya Saluna, O ye who believe, Pray for him, sallu, the word is sallu, from sallah, and salute him with a salutation. Now notice, this verse says to the believers, look, you see how important Muhammad is? Allah and his angels together are praying for him, you should too. So notice, this action is performed by three groups. It's supposed to be per performed by three groups, Allah and his angels and believers. Now would there be any Muslim who would deny that Muslims are commanded to pray for Muhammad? No, they do that all the time. Would any Muslim deny that angels are praying for Muhammad? No. Nope. Then how do you end up denying that Allah actually prays for Muhammad when it's the same verb used in the same context for angels and men along with Allah carrying out this action on behalf of Muhammad or for Muhammad? And if, if, you, if you wanted to make this coherent, if you wanted, because any Muslim, any Muslim who reads Allah prays, he's going to want to say that's not what it means, right? Yes, he's exactly. Going to, and and they'll, even, they'll even translate it in different ways, as send blessings and so on, as you pointed out. But if you want to be consistent, you'd have to say, aha, in this verse, which says Allah, the angels pray, and so you should as well, then if you want to be consistent and translate praise as sends blessings, which that's not what it means, that's not what the word means, then you have to say that when the Quran says to pray, it's actually saying send your blessings. So you Muslims, when you're supposed to pray five times a day, you're actually supposed to send blessings five times a day, hmm. because that, that, that's, that's, that's how we're going to translate it. Allah sends blessings, the angels send blessings, and so you Muslims are supposed to send your blessings. That's, that's shirk, what you, you have know to that, do. Right? You're not shirk, because you're saying angels and humans are able to do what Allah does, namely bless people and send blessing. No Muslim can accept that. Right. You can invoke Allah to bless, because he's the one who blessed, but you yourself can't bless, mm -hmm. right? But if they're saying it means blessing, like you said, that means now three groups have the same ability to bless individuals, which means that there are creatures who are able to do what only Allah can do, namely bless. We only invoke Allah to bless you. When I say I bless you, what I'm saying is I'm invoking God to bless you. I'm praying that you'll be blessed. But I myself don't, don't bless anyone, right? So if you're going to say it means blessing, now you committed shirk. So you're in a situation. And remember, Joshua Evans says that you know, God is perfectly clear when it's, when it's matters of, of, uh, of religious yeah. significance from, related to salvation. But here you have the Quran over and over again saying Allah prays. Yes. But if you bring this up to Joshua Evans, I can almost guarantee he'll say that's not what it means. It means something else. Even though if you try to make it mean something else, then you need to be consistent and you know, apply this everywhere. Won't do it. Won't do it. Why? The same reason he will go to the Bible and go to passages where Jesus is clearly claiming to be God, totally distort and misrepresent, totally pick and choose, because Muslims tend to have what they want to believe about God in mind and then go to the scriptures and interpret them however they need to in order to walk away with that belief. And exactly. Muslims... Here to tell you, the Bible does not fit what you believe, and guess what? Neither does the Quran. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and go to the next uh, video clip, and we'll see what Joshua uh, has come up with.
Number five reason is that Jesus claimed that God's knowledge was greater than his. When he was asked about the hour, the day of judgment, he said, of that day knoweth no man, nor the angels in heaven, nor, 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 nor the, the, the son, but only the father has knowledge of that hour. So if he would have been God, he would have known that. Now, I think Joshua has us here, Sam, because oh, Jesus it. does say that. And here I am. I'm in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 32, where Jesus says, referring to the Judgment Day and so on, But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So he's talking to some kind of future judgment that's going to come. He says, on that day or hour, of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So here, Jesus does not know yep. when this is going to happen. Clear as day, right? I mean, how do you ex escape that? Well, again, because he claims to be a former Christian, then certainly he knows that historically, and when I say historically, on the basis of Scripture, it doesn't matter what Christian theologians have said throughout the centuries, if they're not able to prove what they believe from Scripture, that's merely their opinion. But as you can see from these programs, we aim by the grace of the Lord Jesus, as the Spirit enables us, to prove what we believe from Scripture, because that's ultimate authority for us. Now, throughout history, the response has been, because Christ is truly human, remember, we don't deny that Jesus became a true, true flesh and blood human being. We're not saying he's simply God who assumed a human form, we're not docetists, in other words. We're not like the Gnostics who deny the genuine incarnation. We believe he generally became a flesh and blood human being. He generally had a human consciousness. He generally had a human mind. As a man, we believe that Christ grew like all men. The difference is, as he grew in his wisdom and knowledge, he was guarded and protected from making any mistakes, taking in an error or being mistaken in his information because he's also divine. So as man, I believe that Christ in his waking consciousness did not know everything. Now, how does it work, work out? I don't know. Because I, uh, I'm going to be honest and admit my limitations as a creature. I cannot fully comprehend God, especially when God becomes man. Because now we're dealing with a person who's not just divine. As God, he's infinitely complex and beyond our ability to fully comprehend. He now has taken an additional nature. So now it becomes even more perplexing for me because I don't know of too many godmens, do you? No. When's the last time you ran into a godman? <laughs> the only godman is Jesus Christ. So as man in his waking consciousness, I don't believe he knew everything. But again, because he's God, because he's divine, he was omniscient. So it's not either or, it's both and. Now some will say, ah, but you know what? You're reading your theology into the text. The, the passage is quite clear. Jesus doesn't know everything. Well, the same Bible says he did know everything. So you can either say it's a contradiction or let the Bible speak, which says that he's both God and man. So it's not either or, it's both and. He's God, and as God, he's omniscient. But also, he's truly human, and as a human being, he doesn't know everything. So if I let the Bible speak to his issue, it's both and, and let me prove that. But just quickly looking at some passages which affirm that Christ is omniscient by virtue of being God. But as man, he grew. As man, he doesn't know everything. How does it work? I'm not ashamed, and neither is David ashamed to admit, we don't know how this works. We affirm it because we believe it, and we believe that Christ is risen, and therefore, by affirming it, we're not just bl believing blindly, but we're believing in him who has conquered death, who is the risen Lord of glory. John 2, 23 to 25, same gospel, same New Testament. Notice what it says about Jesus before the resurrection. John 2, 23 to 25, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He knew all and had no need that anyone should testify a man for he knew what was in man. Notice he knows all men and knows what's inside a man. A clear reference to the fact that Christ is omniscient. But if that's not clear for Yusha Evans, John 16, 29 to 31. John 16, 29 to 31, as the Lord Jesus gives us unction to accurately represent what the Bible teaches. His disciples said to him, see now you are speaking plainly. Now pay attention to this, Dave, because earlier you're saying some of these passages are ambiguous, open to multiple interpretations. They're allegorical, right? Mm -hmm. But notice what the disciples say here. See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. So you can't say this is allegorical. This is plain speech. 
Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need, no need that anyone should question you. Now, what, is, what does that mean? In order to know whether someone knows what he's talking about, you'll challenge them. You'll ask tough questions. Oh, yeah, what about this? Notice what the disciples say. We are now convinced you know all things, so you don't need to be tested. We don't need to ask questions to see whether you know everything. We know you know everything. Now, if Jesus is a good Muslim, his response should be one of rebuke. Because they go on, go on to say, by this we believe that you came forth from God. We believe you came forth from God out of heaven, as his word and son, and son who entered into the world. Because now we know you know all things. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? You finally get it? You finally have come to the conclusion that I know all things? Now if Jesus doesn't know all things, what should have response, his response should, should have been here? It should have been one of rebuke. Like when Thomas in the same gospel says, my Lord and my God, he should have rebuked him. Instead, he tells the disciples, you finally believe, you now believe that I know everything? Now he could not say this if he's not omniscient, but because he's omniscient, he could affirm their testimony, their confession. And fi finally, because I know you want to add something to finally, Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27. All things have been delivered to me by my father, my father. No one knows the son except the father. Now, Dave, before I finish the verse, let me ask you a question here. In what sense does the Father know the Son or anyone? If I say the Father knows you, mm -hmm. the Father knows the Son, the Father knows me, in what sense does the Father know a person? He knows everything. Completely about? inside and out, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Lacking nothing, right? Nothing. Could I then say, I know the Father the way the Father knows me? No, absolutely not. But let's see what Jesus goes on to say. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So notice, Christ is saying, the Father knows me in the same way I know the Father. I know the Father in the same way that He knows me. And I'm the only one qualified to then make Him known to others. Does that sound like Christ is denying His omniscience or affirming that He's omniscient? Because He knows the Father in the way the Father knows Him. And He's just as incomprehensible as the Father, which is why only the Father can know Him. Notice it says no one knows the Son except the Father. That's an ad audacious claim because He's basically saying, I'm so incomprehensible that it takes God the Father to know me truly inside and out. Does that sound like the historical Jesus didn't think he was omniscient? No. But at the same time, he didn't know the day or hour. So how do we reconcile it? It's that both and. Yeah. He's God and he's man. And therefore, as God knows everything as man, didn't know everything. And so um, what we have here, what we have, and let me go back and uh, read a passage that we already read earlier. But it's from the book of Philippians where we have the doctrine of the incarnation. Uh, Philippians 2, beginning at chapter, I mean, beginning at verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue conf will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now notice what you have here. Jesus, before the incarnation, is God. He enters into creation in the form of a man. He takes on his physical nature, as John 1 says. And while he has this physical nature, he has limitations of a physical being. Just like, according to Islam, the eternal word of Allah takes on the physical nature of the Quran. Jesus continues to have his physical body even after his resurrection, but it's a resurrected body. And notice what Jesus says when he's asked the same question after his resurrection, the book of Acts chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, Jesus, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? So Jesus, when, you go, when, when is all this going to happen? Notice what he says. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Mm. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Mm. Notice what you had there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Notice Jesus gives a different answer after his resurrection. He doesn't say only the Father knows. He says uh, it's not for you to know. It's not for you to know. 
Exactly. And by the way, I just have to point out the the very verse, yeah. the very yeah, verse yeah, that yeah, Joshua that's, Evans yeah, is quoting. Yeah. What does it say? Of that time. So let's just go with it. Let's just go with the verse, right? Not not interpret it in the light of Christianity. Yeah. Not interpret it in the light of Christian doctrine. Not toss in the doctrine of the kenosis. Ignore the Trinity. Ignore all, all of this. What's this verse saying? Notice what Jesus does because he puts a hierarchy into here, right? Of that time. No one knows, talking about human beings here, no one knows, not even the angels, nor the Son, only the Father. Where's Jesus on this chain of being here? In fact, according to Judaism, or the biblical worldview, the world consists of angels and men. So when you talk about the world of creation, you have two categories. Spirit beings, angels, and then you have human beings, and all the other creatures that live in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Notice what he just said. No man knows, no one here means no man, no angels, but the Son. So the Son transcends the entire category of creation. Because in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, Paul defines the world as consisting of angels and men, meaning the entire category of creatures. So where is Jesus? He transcends the category of creation, subject only to the Father. So even that statement, he shows that he is superior to every created thing, subject only to the Father. And yet this is the passage he wants to use. To Where Jesus the is the Son. Is Jesus the Son according to Islam? No. And that God is the Father? But this is a good passage here, right? Yeah. And so look, look at what you have here. <laughs> Jesus is above all men and above even the angels. He claims to be all-knowing, and yet he claims to not know the day or the hour. You look at all of this and you say, wow, this, 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 something strange going on. Exactly. And you can only make sense of this. This only, can only be reconciled with the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and with the Son entering into creation as a physical human being. When you do that, that's the key to unlocking all of the scripture. Joshua Evans didn't seem to do that, which is why he just can't make sense of any of this. Exactly. All right, we're going to look at our final clip, then we have to wrap things up. So let's go ahead and look at the final clip from Joshua Evans. How could God, if the Trinity was indeed true, and God was God, Jesus was God, the Holy Spirit was God, they're all the same person. That means that how does one not know the same information that the other one knows if they are the same person? If God knows the hour, Jesus should know the hour. The Holy Spirit should know the hour. They should have all known that thing, but even Jesus said in another verse, in John 14, 28, he said, the Father is greater than I. He admitted the Father is greater than I. So if they are equals, how can one be greater than the other? Oh my goodness. Uh, our, our, time is, uh, our time is short, so we're going to have to speed yeah. through this. We definitely want to um, uh, say more about this uh, over the next couple of episodes. But think about this. He defined the Trinity, Fair. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're the same person. Damn, Has right any there. Christian ever defined the doctrine of the Trinity that way? Only heretics mm -hmm. who claim uh, that there are three manifestations, three modes, would say they're the same person. Trinitarianism denies explicitly and ambiguously, they're not the same person. Mm -hmm. That denies uh, that they're the same person, I should say. That's why we're Trinitarians. So we don't believe Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same person. No, that's a so heresy. <laughs> if Joshua Evans doesn't know even what the doctrine of the Trinity said, because to, to be clear, there's a difference between saying, this is the doctrine of the Trinity, and I reject it, Precisely. versus this is the doctrine of the Trinity, and that's not the doctrine of the Trinity. Because that's, that's exactly what Allah does in the Quran, exactly. right? Chapter 5, verse 116, Allah has no clue what the doctrine of the Trinity doctrine, even is. Exactly, yeah. Neither does Joshua Evans, and this is a former youth pastor. How knowledgeable could he possibly be about Christianity if he doesn't know what the doctrine of the Trinity teaches? And he was a youth pastor, so... Very odd. Now, notice what he says. If they, if they were the same person, person, they would know the same things. Remind us, remind us what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27. Which is also found in Luke 10, 22. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. And let me add the Holy Spirit here, because our time is up. But 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12, right? 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12, that the Son knows everything the Father knows. And now, what about the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so... The thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God, the deep things of God, the mind of God. Something that Paul says in Romans 11.33 is humanly impossible. So just to clarify, according to Scripture, Father, Son, Holy Spirit do know all of the same things. 
Right. But the sun enters into creation, takes on a physical nature, things change a little bit, right? Precisely. So in other words, these passages, even the ones he's quoting, make no sense except in light of the doctrine of the Trinity and the amen, Incarnation, amen. which is what we believe. 100%. Now, finally, just to show you the, the, the last little thing he said. Well, Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. Here, here's another perfect example of what's going on. This comes from John chapter 14. It's John chapter 14, verse 28. Sam, ha we have an entire video of Sam discussing this passage. You can type into Google, why did Jesus say the Father is greater than I for a full discussion? Our time is almost up, so we're going to have to be uh, brief here. In John chapter 14, Jesus says over and over again that he does the things that only God does. He answers prayer, according to John 14, correct? Exactly, 13 and 14 right there. Jesus yep. answers prayer. He does all of these things that only God can do. And especially, and especially if you go John 14 through 16, where, I mean, he's the one who sends the Holy Spirit. And he says he's the life and the truth in John 14, 6, two of the names and characteristics of God the in way, John the 14, truth, 6. The yeah. No one comes to the Father except through him. Well, what's he mean when he, says, when he says the Father is greater than I? Well, if you read John <laughs> chapter 14, Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. Yeah, that's there too. Right. It's all in there. In that chapter, he claims yeah. over and over again to be divine. If you look at what Jesus is claiming in this passage, this is one of the clearest claims to deity that we have. If, if, you, read the, if you read the passage in context, in this passage, Jesus is telling his followers that he's going away, right? He's going to die. But he knows they're upset. Oh, he's leaving us. He's going to die. This is horrible. If you look at what Jesus is saying, he tells them he's God so that they understand when he dies, that's not the end. He says he's going back to the Father. In other words, you have the entire doctrine that we read in Philippians where he lowers himself to enter into creation. And what he, his message for his followers is that he's then going back. He's returning to receive the glory that he had Amen. before the incarnation. John 17, so, 5, yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and read that, but I'll read the, the entire verse of verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 28. You heard that I said to you, I go away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So if you love me, you'd be happy that I'm leaving because I'm going back to where I belong. I'm putting away the humiliated state that I am taking on as a human being. I'm going back to the glory ahead. And if it's not clear enough, Sam brought up, uh, John 17, chapter 17, five. verse 5, let me read it, where Jesus is praying, entered in creation, he prays, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus had glory with the Father before the world existed? Exactly. Can't so even, even in the verses that Joshua Evans is quoting to prove Islam, if you even make any slight attempt to understand what he's saying, once again, they only make sense in light of the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation. Joshua doesn't seem to understand the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of the Incarnation, and that's why he keeps making these huge blunders. Well, Joshua has several more points to discuss, so we're going to head, go ahead and wrap up now, but we will uh, return, and we will go through all of his remaining points here on the next episode of Jesus or Muhammad.